is leaving the resort. Can't go to practice today, but here's what everybody looks like walking out. That's right. That's right. Anyways, uh, Sacramento Kings opened training camp yesterday, not in Hawaii, right here in Sacramento, which is uh, which is a nice consolation prize. One of the the things that I was noticing when videos were being posted of players talking after practice, uh -huh. everybody looked like they had just run a marathon. Oh yeah, they were they were sprinting. Like obviously they had just exercised, like they had just played basketball, right? But usually, like a post practice presser, there might be a little sweat, maybe a little towel, and you know just. But it felt like every player talking looked like they just got done running twenty six point two miles or whatever, and then immediately stepped in to talk with the media. Yeah. So basically, when we walked in the building, uh, they they let us in. We opened. We walked into the the main gym. And they were doing basically uh, a really, really fast version of a layup line. And so players had to pass to a passer. That guy had to give it to another guy who's running by. And so basically you're running full court back and forth one after another, Oof. Uh, you know, making passes and, and not turning the ball over. So they're really working on pace. They're working on uh, conditioning really to get the, the preseason started, but also this is who they want to be this year. They want to get back to the pace that, that they had mm -hmm. two years ago and, and maybe even the pace that they had before that when mm -hmm. they were one of the fastest paced teams in the league. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to, if you're going to do that, you have to establish it day one of training camp. Yep. And you got to keep doing it every day and, and until the players are totally sick of, of Mike Brown and his coaching staff. Yeah. I mean, that's, and Mike Brown talked about it last year. It's not just pace for the sake of pace, right? Mm -hmm. It's just running to run. And it doesn't even necessarily mean like, hey, dribble the ball as fast as you can every single time. But it's about, uh, last year it was Harrison Barnes, but uh, this year it'll be Keegan Murray or DeMar DeRozan or whoever. Like if they're going to go get into their offense, it is getting up the floor and getting into the offense. And that was one of the things we talked a lot about with, with Davion Mitchell last year too. Was like, man, they just don't, it, they're not getting into their offense. It was like 14 seconds on the shot clock. Yeah. And that's what that's more what this is about. And I think you're right. Establishing that on day one is is something that I think Mike Brown is going to try and do. Uh, well, he established it day one and he's going to continue to try to do that day two, day three, day four. I think that'll be a theme. Yeah, I think so, too. And it you really do have to run the guys mm -hmm. and, and make it uncomfortable. I remember the uh, the season that Dave Yeager took over and uh, well, it wasn't season he took over. It was his second season when all of a sudden he had a bunch of young kids. Mm -hmm. right and well maybe that was his third season mm -hmm. so he's going into this year and he knows it like he the only way to to change anything to to be competitive at all is to just put the foot on the gas and yeah. try to outrun everyone and i just remember Amon shumpert first of all Amon shumpert does an amazing eddie murphy uh impersonation great and he would you could hear him like all over the gym doing his eddie murphy laugh and and having a good time. None of the players understood or knew who Eddie Murphy was. Of course. Um, but he would come over and be like, this is crazy. I've never done anything like this. I've never run like this in a camp. Yeah. And Dave's like, look, we're going to, this is one of the few things we've got. Yeah. We're young and we're fast. So we're going to try to just like turn on the jets. Right. Yeah. And inbound the ball as fast as possible. And if you don't set that mindset on day one, if you try to ramp up during the season, no just, chance. You no, have no chance. Well, that and you you have players get injured because mm -hmm. they're just not ready for it. I mean, yeah. we saw it yesterday. Uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. went down with a with like a hamstring strain or a calf strain yesterday, first day of training camp. Um, like, all right, like, what were you doing? Are you ready? Or are you not ready? Side note on Jaron Jackson, just real quick detour. Yep. Um, did you watch the video of his answer about Dikembe Mutombo? No. So Dikembe was. Jaron Jackson's dad's roommate in college. Oh, okay. George. So he knew Dikembe really well from the time he was very small and he got asked about it and he gave this really like short answer at first and then got asked a different question and launched into this like two minute long, really heartfelt answer about what Dikembe, about who Dikembe was to him and what he meant to him as like a person and as a player. And I'm not a Jaron Jackson guy, but it was impossible not to root for him in that moment. Interesting. Like it was just if you if you want to go find it, just look up Jaron Jackson, Dikembe Mutombo, and I'm the video is all over the place. It is really really good. But anyways, um, back to the Kings. 
Unless you have thoughts on Dikembe Mutombo and Jaron Jackson. Well, no, it's okay I okay mean, if you don't. <laughs> I think I, I think the world, the NBA world, is super small, and I think that's something that people like they miss quite often. Yeah, like Jason Tatum is uh, his dad, and Larry Hughes were like BFFs, and yeah. and that's his godfather, which is wild. Like, there's about. all of these different connections all yeah. over the place that that you you wouldn't normally just like trace just like how we were talking about it yesterday mm -hmm. uh, we all just flat out didn't even look to notice that trey lyles played two years with demar de rosen in san yeah. antonio yeah like there are these different you know like connections it's, it's insane when you listen to an nba player's podcast oh yeah uh the the austin rivers one is the one i listen to the most i, I really enjoy his pod a lot but it's crazy how often and this isn't exclusive to him it's any nba player's podcast how often a player will come up and everybody just knows that player. Mm. Like, oh yeah, we played AAU together. Or, oh, I spent time with him. Or I've been playing against him since I was 12. Like that, it's, it is every single player. I don't know him that well, but I spent some time with him doing X. Like, hey, I, I had NBC. Doing X like the, not doing ecstasy. Sorry, go on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had NBC uh, hit me up one time and say, hey, uh, the Jazz are coming through town, and we're wondering if you can go sit down with uh, Donovan Mitchell during their shoot around and talk about uh, his relationship with Eric Pascal. I'm like, okay. So I look it up. I'm like, okay, they're tight. Oh, for the Warriors. Yeah, for the Warriors. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, I went to the, the Jazz media. I sent them an email. They they may or may not have got back to me. Mm -hmm. Then I go talk to their guys. I'm like, hey. Uh, they're asking me to do this, like sit in the stands for like a couple of minutes and just have a quick conversation about Eric Pascal. Mm -hmm. I guess they're really close. And the jazz response was, yeah, Donovan's close like that with everyone. And I'm like, okay, so no, or you're going to give him to me. And they're like, well, we'll check with him. And so I, they go over, they talk to Donovan. He goes, oh yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll go talk. So me and Donovan Mitchell went up to the stands and they, they like went to AAU tournaments where the parents are driving together and they're yeah. in the car from the time they're like nine or 10 years old until they, you know, stop playing together. And like, they really, really knew each other. Yeah. And so that's where you're like, yeah, there are people, everyone knows Donovan. Yeah. Like again, De'Aaron Fox and Donovan Mitchell have been playing together, uh, playing against each other sure. since they were like 14 years old. Mm -hmm. Well, 114, 115. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you, you just don't really connect all the dots until you really sure. start having conversations or, or you see a, a photo of De'Aaron Fox's AAU team and like Kelly Oubre's in the like, picture. I can identify nine of these players. Yeah, Justin <laughs> Jackson's in the picture. You're like, wow, he played with everyone. Yeah. yeah. And they played against Harry Giles every day. Yeah. If you've ever traveled for sports, there's no greater bond than the one built in the back of like a minivan on a long road trip to a sporting event. All of my my oldest, all of his friends yeah. are his soccer buddies from the time that they were 10 years old. That you drove to tournaments with. And all of my youngest, they're all the younger brothers of all yep. of the older soccer boys yep. that, that we drove everywhere. We went to and tournaments it's like, together. That doesn't yeah. change. In fact, that gets probably more dramatic as you go up and people drop out of the ranks. Oh, yeah. Like now you're just, you, you might play on the same team with a guy for 10, 12 years. Oh, yeah. Draymond Green and Steph Curry have been together for 13 years. Like they're just on wild. the same team. Yep. You play against, you're in the league 10, 12, 14 years. You're playing against the same guys four, sometimes four times a year, two, three, four times a year. Like you just see these people all the time. <laughs> just yeah. around. No, all the time. And your families are around all the time. And, and it really does become such an incredible bond. And I've seen it so clearly with my son and his friends where mm -hmm. it's not just that they're tight, mm -hmm. but their personalities match up to their positions. And so That's like funny. my son has always been the defender and he's always the defender of them. He's the one that listens. He's mm -hmm. the one that they all come to. He's a protector. You have the aggressive guy in the middle mm -hmm. who's now off at San Diego state, having a great time sure. uh, getting in all kinds of trouble. And then you have the goal scorer guy who like having a great time at UC <laughs> Santa Barbara, but a different type of a great time than the other buddy. I bet, I bet <laughs> in high school, if I knew I don't know what the exact number is. If I knew 20 people who went to either Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara, UC Santa Cruz, or San Diego State, if I knew 20 people that went to those three schools combined, I bet I know six people who graduated. Oh, yeah. So many people back in Brentwood after a year. Oh, it's or tough. Two. It's tough. I had a hard time at Sac State.
They're having a not good a time. lot going on at Sac State. <laughs> I had a hard time there. That's right. Uh, stingers up, baby. Uh, that's James Ham. I'm Kyle Madsen. We're the insiders. We're sponsored by Jiffy Luber. Hanging out with you until noon. Uh, if you want to join the program, phone lines are open. Call the Elk Grove Kia Talk Line 916-909-1320. 916-909-1320 is the phone number. Um, also want to remind you to download the James Ham and Kyle Madsen show. That is our podcast. Uh, it's this show. We break it down by hour and then we put the full show up. So if you miss anything, you can go back and listen. If you want to revisit anything, uh, you can download the James, uh, download and subscribe to the James Ham and Kyle Madsen show wherever you get your podcast. We would appreciate that immensely. One more housekeeping thing. Um, if you're watching on YouTube or Twitch, salute. Thank you so much. Please hit that thumbs up button. Uh, right there below the video on YouTube. Please uh, subscribe to the ESPN 1320 channel as well. Uh, we would appreciate that uh, immensely. I think I said immensely like six times there. We it's would appreciate okay. it a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. It, right. And if you're going to say it once, you might as well say it I'm just gonna. Times. I'm just going to keep hammering it. Yeah, for sure. That's right. Pause. Um, all right. So back to King's training camp. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to please explain you, you wrote down in our in our pre-show communication uh you mentioned that malik monk and mike brown got into it sort of not yeah really. uh, not please not explain really. but what explain the malik monk experience that happened yesterday okay so we get to the end of practice they, they've been running non-stop they're mm -hmm. running up and down the court everyone's having not a great time because they're all gasping <laughs> for air and then they all huddle up and you know they clap and everything else and then all of a sudden you hear malik monk just going off and i guess what had happened was uh malik had had found their uh practice chart their sheet that details what's going to happen all throughout practice and at the bottom of that it had their end time and they had blown through their end time while they were running uh oh and uh malik was not okay with that and I, it was in fun but it was sure. also um I, I think it was trying funny. to set a tone he He's setting the tone that his voice will be heard, which to me is really interesting because it's something that's developed over the last couple of years, and you need that spirit. And I think it's it's funny because we we asked Marta Rosen about it uh, afterwards, and just like, hey, did you get the full Malik Monk experience? And it's like, e yes, I did, and that's crazy. He said, but he had a big smile on his face, and he said, but this is like my sixteenth training camp, so you always have that guy somewhere and it's just fun to see that we have that guy here and that it's Malik yeah. and you know, I'll get to know him a lot better as time goes on, but that he's here and you know, it, it's, this is going to be fun because that was a good time and I enjoyed him doing that mm -hmm. and like his ability to like step up and say something, uh, whether it was appropriate or not, but I think he was just having a good time and, uh, that's what happens. It happens early in camp, but also that's what happens when Malik monks on your roster. I'm going to start doing that if we have a meeting that goes long. <laughs> Just I think I need to lay start doing that. Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> Even if it wasn't Charlie's fault. Charlie. Charlie's our boss. Charlie, I'm looking at I'm looking at the clock here. We're a little late. We're a little late to finishing this meeting. <laughs> I'm sure that wasn't what Malik was saying. Maybe. We're a little late. <laughs> yeah, Mike. Excuse me. <laughs> Is there a concern that they'd run too much? Like that's kind of one of the so so this is where the the NFL and the NBA are a little bit different because you hear all the time the there's you know some coaches like to take it really easy in practices some coaches like to like to really like callous their their players with like these really hard practices the Niners kind of go um a little bit of both if they have a really hard day of practice the next day they might just have no pads on to take it really easy um the concern about the like going like, hey, we're going to three days of tough practices this week uh, is that you're a going to get guys hurt or B, you're just going to run guys into the ground before the season starts. I know it's different sports. You're preparing for for different things, different types of seasons, different types of um, in shape. But is that a concern at all for you? OK, so year one of Mike Brown, I've I've said this a million times. I've never seen a team practice as much. I've never seen a team practice longer. Um, all they did was practice. And like, there's there's a... Um, the NBA has its calendar year, right? And there are a specific amount of days off that you have to give your team where they are right. days off. 
right. right? Where they do not have to practice. Yeah. It's expected that if guys need treatment or if guys want to come in and shoot or whatever, they're allowed to come in the gym and all that. But an organized mandatory practice. Yes. But mandatory practice or game day. Yeah. There has to be actually, I, it's something like 18 days off the entire season, something crazy like that, which only works out to like three days a month or something. Um, so anyway, huh. They, uh, but they build out the entire schedule and we learned that, that Mike Brown had, had this entire calendar built out at the beginning of the season with no leeway and they practiced every day. Like they had a back to back on the road and practice the next day. They, they, there were times where I, I literally thought to myself, I, first of all, I've never covered anything like this. How do you practice during a back to back? The day after a back to back. They, oh, the day after the second. Okay, yeah, got it, got the it, got day it. after sorry, a back-to-back. Back. No, no, there were times where it was like, oh my That's gosh, wild. I can't believe they're practicing. And I think you can do that one year, but then in year two, the reason you're doing that is you're establishing your culture, mm -hmm. but you're also instituting your offensive and defensive schemes. And when things are going wrong defensively, you got to keep tweaking and trying to figure out mm -hmm. what it is that you're trying to work through and all that stuff. So I think that there is like a, in the grand scheme of things, having practice like that. And then that first year, the Kings didn't get hurt at all. Mm -hmm. Like they had one of the cleanest bill healths we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And it was because they practice every day because body emotion tends to stay in motion. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I thought it was a good thing, but by the end of the year, that's a lot of being together. That's a lot of having the same coach yelling at you Yeah, when you're winning. It's fine. The next year, uh, Mike toned it back a little bit. And to be honest with you, I thought there were times where I thought he had toned it back a little bit too much. Mm. And, and it was like, he was trying not to be that guy. He was trying not sure. to be the guy that everyone hated because all they did was practice all the time. And so I, I think there is a happy medium that you have to find and yeah. you have to, you have to have honest conversations with your players about, Hey, am I pushing you guys too hard? Are mm -hmm. we doing this too much? Is, is there something I can do to lighten the load? Or is there a way that we can work through this? where you guys don't feel like it's my voice yelling sure. all the time. Sure. Um, and so there's a give and take, but this is year three. The Kings have a huge amount of carryover players, a ton still. Like, they're not running it back because DeMar DeRozan's there and, and, and Jordan mm -hmm. McLaughlin's there. They have a lot of continuity, though. But the continuity is still there, mm -hmm. right? They still have all these players. So you already have your offensive uh, situ situation figured out. You already have your defensive sets figured out. There are tweaks that you're making, and that's kind of the first couple of days of camp is walking through, getting some of those new ideas put in. Uh, but at the same time, there is a certain level of, of responsibility to pushing the tempo, to getting your players in the right shape. So you don't have injuries a week in. Uh, yeah. two weeks in and you know day four is always a day we circle is a day that you know you've had a couple of two days mm -hmm. where they're pr practicing at night but they're doing a lot of contact a lot of scrimmage stuff mm -hmm. and then by day four there's a lot of ice bags a lot of dudes are feeling it feeling yeah it. yeah um yeah i think the 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 interesting thing for me um will kind of be how that shakes out throughout the year again because you're trying to in camp. You're not there. I don't think they're going to do anything new necessarily offensively. But we talked yesterday. Like you're integrating Demar Derozan into this. Isn't integrating? Hey, you're a new seventh guy. Like no, no this is a, a a offensive focal point that you now have to to integrate. And that's and that's one thing. But um, how they how they manage that with the okay? We also need to get in just basketball shape and running and mm -hmm. and doing the and establishing that again. Um, it, it, there's just, there's a lot to balance and having DeMar DeRozan is going to make life easier for the Kings, I think. But, um, I think the, the preparation for the season and, and finding that middle ground between, um, overdoing it with trying to get all, all the things I just listed versus not doing enough mm -hmm. because you mentioned like the, the injury stuff, uh, the injuries they had last year were not the Luka Doncic went runaway train on uh, and, and ran into Malik Monk. And then you have Kevin Herter getting his arm swiped down. Yeah. It wasn't, it's not like soft tissue stuff where they just, it's like, Oh man, those guys weren't in good enough shape. No. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think when you start having a team that has multiple players that are playing 78, 79, 80, 81, 82 games, mm -hmm. 
And last season against uh, Sabonis, uh, Harrison Barnes, Keegan Murray, like there, there's a bunch of these players that yeah. played nonstop until Malik Monk got hurt. He hadn't missed a game. Or yeah. It was like one. Yeah. Um, you know, De'Aaron Fox missed a couple of games throughout the season, but not that many. Like this is a team that typically stays healthy and it's because they do work hard. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a good thing. It's a, it's a culture uh, that, that this team has had. And, and to be honest, it was a lot of the Harrison Barnes culture. Yeah. It, this is something that, you know, Harrison Barnes has always set the standard here. And they have to find that new voice. And yeah. I, I think part of that's tomorrow, but part of it is a guy like Malik Monk. We talked about it yesterday. It's like a collection of quiet guys mm-hmm. and then one noisy one. Well, maybe two. Like, I think Mason Jones also has that sort of like that. Uh, Does he have vibe. the cachet to be that voice, though? No. no. Like, if Mason Jones starts speaking up about how long practice went, it's like, ugh. Well, who are you? No, that would have been like, yeah, uh, here's your, your waiver papers. Yeah. yeah. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It will. And I, I've talked about this Wait, a little bit too. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, uh, like this, the voice of Malik Monk is finding right now uh-huh. is the same, ex- is, is a voice he did not have in LA. And it's a voice he did not have in Charlotte. Uh-huh. And when he was in LA and he's a little brother, it's really, it's difficult to find this voice and to be somebody who can, lighten the room but also be a, a leader yeah a- and that's sort of the maturation of players and we're we're getting to see it play out with you know with fox and with some and some bonus and those mm-hmm. guys but also with a guy like this who uh who hadn't found his place in the nba and not only does he find a big contract but a home and mm-hmm. and a place where he feels comfortable to to step up and say something to a coach even if it's in a loving manner yeah i think there's uh, just to rewind to mason jones real quick because i don't want to put the guy down I do think there's value in that kind of personality if in the in, having a player like that in the role that he would have if he makes if he makes the 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 roster, right? Mm-hmm. If he's the 15th guy, if they're like, "You know what? He had a great ca- we can't afford to not have this guy in the locker room yeah. or 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 on the end of the bench." Having a player like him at the end of the bench it, when when he first came up last season, uh Deuce Mason was like, "Hey, look at this guy on the bench. Like the Kings don't have a guy like this." Mhm. I genuinely think that there is value in that. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to, like I said, just dump on Mason Jones. Well, and to get back to like what we were talking about when we started the show, like we all remember who that guy was like uh, on your baseball team, your basketball team, your football team, even, you know, the soccer. The loud guy who didn't play a lot? Well, the loud, yeah. Okay. What but up? It's the guy who like when it's you're your coming up the sidelines is, is giving high fives, who's, who's hugging everybody, who's, yeah who's bringing up the overall like tenor of the room and Mm -hmm. like a guy like Mason Jones, while he won't be that uh, in front of everyone to Mike Brown, what he will do is bring a really good energy throughout every single drill that they're doing throughout the day, putting his arm around guys being like that bubbly personality. And that's a good thing. It is a good thing to have those guys. No, he is. He's a vibes guy. He's a little Malik Monk Jr. on the vibes uh, (laughs) guy angle, but um, but that's okay. Um, before, but uh, before we get deeper into the King stuff, we also are, are going to talk about the Devonte Adams trade, uh, rumors, news. I'm not even sure what to call it. The trade percolation, uh, with Devonte Adams. We'll also dive into that. But before, <laughs> did you see that the Knicks and Timberwolves trade got finalized? Oh yeah. It's wild. So the Charlotte Hornets have, uh, agreed to take on salary and they're going to waive that salary. And they got, I think three second round picks to do it. Um, basically f- from what Keith Smith and in Spo track was saying was their new GM is trying to build some cachet with the league. Oh, we're like, yeah, we'll do this favor for you. We're in a spot where we can do this favor for you to maybe, you know, facilitate a deal down the line. Okay. Which I thought was interesting, but Dwayne Washington jr. Was part of this deal. Mm. Only the problem was that Dwayne Washington jr. Was a free agent. And the Knicks had his free agent rights, except he had signed with the team, I believe, in Turkey. Yeah. No, Serbia. Serbia. Partizan, signed with the team in right? Serbia. Yeah, Partizan. Uh, so he was playing in Serbia, but he has to get waived or let go by his Serbian team to be able to sign an NBA contract. But he can't do that until he gets a letter of certification from FIBA yep. that says he can leave his contract. But then he has to wait 48 hours after he gets waived by Charlotte because he's now an NBA. If a team wants to claim him off waivers, like they can, they're not yep. going to. So he has to wait 48 hours and then he can go back to Partizan, but he can't go back to Partizan until he gets a, a, the letter of, I think, certification, the LOC from FIBA to rejoin 
the league that's under FIBA's jurisdiction, jurisdiction. There you go. Thank you. And they, Partizan, are in the middle of like a bunch of Euro League matches that are really important to them. And Dwayne Washington is one of their best players. Mm. It's wild. So they figured it all out. They got the deal done. Shout out to Dwayne Washington Jr. for whatever the heck he's going through right now. Well, that and then you have Kings legend Daquan Jeffries, who is basically an NBA unhomed person. He gets signed for three point four million, two point nine million, two point eight million, two point six million, whatever it was. It's two point nine, I think. Just to get traded to Charlotte, where he may get waived. He basically just to be part of a transaction. He just made almost three million bucks. Merry Christmas, Daquan Jeffries. Than, didn't have to move. Didn't because he knows he's getting waived. He didn't have to report to camp. Yeah, and then he can go sign somewhere else. He's gonna have a fat check at his bank account. That's fire. If any team wants to include me in a trade, you can let me know. There it is. Uh, I'm around. All right, Devonte Adams trade. Plenty more on the Kings training camp. We have uh, we got a big show. I hate that we don't have a big show lined up. We have a regular have a ass show. show. Huge show. Huge jam packed show. We're hanging out with you till noon. That's James Ham. I'm Kyle Madsen. We're the insider sponsored by Jiffy Lube here on ESPN 1320 Sacramento Sports Center. Oh, no. Nope, we're going to break. What just happened? I knew I forgot to do something. Are we on break? Yeah, we're a break. I think. Yeah, we are. We're good. I forgot to uh, do the stack, so we have a bunch of stuff out of place that I have to go fix right now. Oh, all right. I, I will talk to the good people. Yeah, please talk to the people. Hey, uh, Jason Anderson told me yesterday that our uh, that all of ESPN 1320 has been super quiet over the last couple of days, or maybe the last two weeks. If you guys hear that, like, give us a mention, like, give us a shout here in the chat and tell us. I don't know. A lot of you guys are here in the chat, so you're not listening on the radio. But uh, if you're out and about in your cars and you hear something funky with the station, uh, let us know. So I reached out to uh, Jonathan and Seth, and and Jonathan said that they had fixed it that day. Like, oh, okay. Shout out to J.A., I think somewhere, somewhere, someone had just turned down a knob. There it is. Yeah. It is. This probably doesn't interest anybody watching, but it's interesting to me, so I'm going to talk about it. It is crazy how many... Thanks, Peg. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> it is crazy how many things like matter when it comes to when it comes to like radio and the things you have to do to be successful and like all this other it is like the things you got to do to be successful like on the technical side mm -hmm. like that goes beyond there are certain things you could have the best radio show in existence but if like two or three things are off on the on the like deep technical side like going beyond just the show being on air or the microphones being on there's so many things going on behind the scenes that matter that I would have never even considered. Oh, no, totally. Yeah, but see, here's the, the Mac. You got to tell us if this is happening so we can fix it. That's, that's all I'm asking. So, yeah, it's um, like when you're, you're doing like film work too, uh, audio is all that really matters. Like yep. the quality of audio. It's why like the Blair Witch Project mm -hmm. is like, one of the worst films of all time when it comes to actually like being a film. Mm -hmm. um, but the audio just keeps you engaged the entire time and you're freaking out. Like they're yeah. freaking out. Right. Even though you can't see anything and they can't see anything. Right. It's, it, it's all about the audio. Yeah. And if you have bad audio, you know, so sorry, but uh, if my videos coming out of practice are it's so funny. like the audio isn't great, but it happens working on it, it's working like, through it. It's like somebody, and I don't know why it's specific to you. I don't know if it's the mic or where you stand or what, but it's like, it's like somebody is bouncing a basketball. Like they moved the mic. Oh, I know. They're just slamming a basketball. It is insane. 
and I and it's different mics. Like I'm gonna try a different setting on a different mic today. So, yeah, yeah. My audio was better yesterday. My f day one at training camp. I mean, uh, media day. I forgot a nine volt battery for my one of my other mics. Here we go. Now, back to the Insiders with James Ham and Kyle Madsen, brought to you by Jiffy Lube on ESPN 1320. Uh, if you're listening on the radio, you're hearing the instrumental for Blow the Whistle by Too Short. Play that at a wedding, you're getting a show. Oh. I'm doing the whole song. Okay. Not the whole song. <laughs> I'm doing almost the entire song. It's so good. My friend has added it to his wedding playlist for next year. He's like, all right, you're on. I'm like, all right. All right. I don't even need to have drinks. Let's do it. You can play that when I first walk in the building. Doesn't even matter. It's, Just it's the your, intensity of the show is going to go up the more I've had to drink. It's your intro song? Yeah, it is. If you were a Major League Baseball player, would that be your intro? No, it wouldn't. Oh. I have made a, I, I have a, I have, I, for a long time, I didn't have a good answer to this. Okay. Because there are just so many songs I like. I'd be one of those guys that I think Matt Chapman had this when he was in Oakland, and it might, it might, he might have it in in San Francisco too. But he has like four walk up songs, and they rotate. Oh, that's how I would be. Uh, but right now, at the top of the list, would be the song "Mountains" by Stray Kids. Okay, it's a really great song. Which should you, also be the theme of the the Kings season. You want the that theme to be song the theme for the Kings? Yeah, <laughs> it's a really good song. Go listen to it. It's a it's a lot of fun. Um. All right, we're talking about. I want to. I want to put a pin in the in the training camp stuff because we got plenty to get into with the with the shooting guard stuff and who should start there and and Kevin Herter and Keon Ellis and Malik Monk, et cetera, et cetera. I want to. I want to run something by you though, because I I feel like we haven't we haven't discussed this in the Demar Derozan uh, vein yet. Okay, and I want to say this uh, with with this up top. Uh. I believe DeMar DeRozan is going to be really good, and I think the Kings are going to be a playoff team comfortably and win 50-plus games. Okay, That's what I believe is going to happen. If I was making a bet about the Kings this season, that's the bet I would make. What happens if DeMar DeRozan looks like a 35-year-old? Typically looks. Like, what happens... What What's the contingency plan? If DeMar DeRozan's, like, good, but it's like, oh, like, oh, he's... Oh, he aged a little bit. Not that, not that I think he's going to be bad. Like, it's not that... But if he's just not quite what they're expecting, it's an interesting question. Um, to be honest with you, it depends on when they realize that and whether Demar Derozan realizes that. Because, like, mm. look, Demar is going to be here for for two, probably three years. Yeah, yeah. And during that time, there there will likely be regression at some point. Uh, sure. And, and you're hoping age 35, 36, and 37 seasons. Yeah. I think initially it's going to be on the defensive end. There'll be some regression, right? Mm -hmm. And then on the offensive end, you expect him because he's a bucket. Like that's what he does as a player yes. is something it, it's almost like I don't, I don't enjoy Paul Pierce at all. Like whatever Paul Pierce is like post career, I don't enjoy at all, but whatever he was during his career, I didn't typically Enjoy Not a super aesthetically pleasing game. His style at, at all either. Mm -hmm. But the way that he could score a bucket with two or three people draped all over him mm -hmm. and that he just knew where the rim was at all time. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I can't believe he couldn't. There's no way he could even know where the rim was. Yeah. And and it was nothing but net. That is kind of like the the old man game, the yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. like the the YMCA game that that DeMar DeRozan has. Yeah. And I, I think that that part of his game will age perfectly well. I think sure. the peripherals of what he is and like the defensive metrics and stuff like that, it will start to regress pretty quickly because that's it's just that's the what way it is. Yeah, right. People age now. It's possible that that it doesn't happen in the next three years. It is sure you know. And like, are we asking these same questions about Steph Curry? Eh, no, they're kind of they're roughly the same. Some age. of us are. They're both going a year sixteen, yeah. right? Um, I think you should be asking that, but you're also looking at a player in Demar that has always been healthier than, that's not my, than that's, Steph Curry. That, I, I, that, I'm sorry. This, this, this is not. That's not my question. Though. No, no. I have the like, answer to like your like question. Like I said, if I'm betting on it, I'm betting that he's going to be 
20 plus points. And he's going to be one of those guys that when he's 50 is going to be able to just cash on whoever's defending him from, from 12 feet. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. He's just, that's, that's how he's, he's going to be. But my, my question is if that regression happens offensively this year, where it's like, man, he's just not quite as efficient. Is it just more De'Aaron Fox? Is it DeMar now? I I don't think it'd be so, so drastic where he's coming off the bench, but is it, is it just more De'Aaron Fox? Is it now more on Keegan Murray? Yeah. Okay. So that to answer your question, I, I think like when we look at De'Aaron Fox and we look at Demonis Sabonis, their their quality of play, their where they're at as players is going to stay roughly the same. Like sure. you can see a spike a little bit in the scoring from Fox. You can see a take down a little bit in rebounding or or, or mm-hmm. a, assist from Sabonis. But basically, they are who they are as players. We're going to see that for the next five or six years through their prime, mm-hmm. right? And then I would even say the same thing about Malik Monk. I think, you know, between 13, 15 points, four and a half to five and a half assists, we're going sure. to see that player for the next couple of years, mm-hmm. right? The The way that I've always looked at this is if DeRozan isn't as good as, as you hope that he will be, then it's got to be a balance between him and Keegan Murray. And as, as DeMar DeRozan starts to regress slowly, mm-hmm. you need... You need Mal- uh, yeah, Keegan to pick Ke- up the slack. Keegan to slowly sure. increase and increase who he is as a player, and I think it's a perfect situation to be in mm-hmm. because as much as um, you know, sort of Keegan is going to rely on on uh, Demar Derozan to make him better as a player and to help him continue to increase. The only way that Demar Derozan is going to be able to stay on the court for thirty four thirty five minutes a game is if Keegan Murray has his back defensively. No and, doubt. And, and no so doubt. there's always going to be this balancing point. And I really do think it's sort of a perfect marriage between two players, one at the beginning of his career, one at the end of his career, mm-hmm. like in, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Uh, where, you know, like, again, we can say DeMar DeRozan is entering the final phase of his career because like, he's 16 years in. Like, there, his final phase can't be it's, another 16 years. Sure, <laughs> he's not sure. at the midway point here. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do think that there's a way in which these guys just continuously balance each other out as they get, uh, as they move through this season, next season, and the season after that. And so I don't really, I'm not all that concerned with it because I think there is sure. like untapped potential that will be held back slightly by the addition of, of uh, DeMar DeRozan, mm-hmm. but also a, a way that DeMar DeRozan is going to allow King Murray to grow into the player he's supposed to be mm-hmm. at the right pace. Yeah. Not, not at Caleb Williams, go try to get us wins in your first four weeks of your NFL career at a yeah. pace that makes sense that as one of them ascends, the other one is allowed to descend slightly. Yeah. And ideally at a pace, because I, I kept asking for this last year and it was just, just clearly not who Keegan is as a player, not at a pace where it's like, Hey, need you now. Like, Hey, the, we need you to max out you. We need you to get to your ceiling, like by the trade deadline, please. Yeah. Like that just that's I don't think that's the kind of player that Keegan Murray is going to be. Well, that and Kyle, I, I think one of the points I would make is that DeMar DeRozan, while he's an older player, mm-hmm. if you looked at all of the guys that we talked about, right, whether it's, uh, you know, Kyle Kuzma or it's Brandon Ingram or it's uh, even Laurie Marketing, Sure. As those if they would have gone out and been able to land any one of those players you still would have based a lot of your understanding of who the Kings are going to be this year off of what Keegan Murray is because yeah, like Kyle Kuzma is a a, a really good player. He's not a great player, but he's a really good player. You need Keegan to be equal to or greater than Kyle Kuzma, Mm -hmm. Brandon Ingram. You need him to be equal to or greater than, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even Laurie Markkinen. You need him to be really close to how good Laurie Markkinen is for this whole thing to work. Mm -hmm. DeMar DeRozan walks in and he will do what he does no matter what. Like he's yeah. so established in in what he does, and so established in his greatness within what he does. Yeah, and so you're you're allowing Keegan to to like learn from someone new for sure. That yeah. to me, that's one of the biggest things I think that he will get from this. It's one thing to have you know Harrison Barnes as your vet, and to have him be sort of like the guy who's got his arm around you and leading you through the first couple of that's years. That's nice for a year or two. Yeah, you need a change, and mm-hmm. that's not a knock on Harrison. And I, I think Harrison is a perfect player to go work with Victor Wimanyama and to work with Devin Vassell and, and all of the young guys in, in San Antonio. But I, I think there's also another moment where, depending on personality, 
a guy like Keegan might need a different voice, and that yeah. different voice can come from a guy who's going in the Hall of Fame. He's yeah. a six-time All-Star who, mm-hmm. who at age 34 last year, averaged 24 points, five assists, five rebounds a game. Yeah. Like, that's just good a player. really, really, really good player. Mm-hmm. And so I, I like how they, they're going to blend these guys. And I, and I hope that, that Keegan is, like, sitting there listening to Damara and, yeah. and trying to draw as much as they can in the same way that De'Aaron Fox did with Vince Carter when he was a young kid. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. That's what, that's, I think that's my other bit. If I'm, if I'm just being Captain Pessimist over here, um, which I am want to do. Uh that would be the other one of the one of the things that I, that actually I think helps with with my concerns about Keegan Murray is he's now in a place where um how am I trying to say this? I started saying two different things. Let me back up, rewind. Okay, here we go. Reset three, two, we'll fix this in post. Three, two, and one. Um one of my concerns with DeMar DeRozan coming to Sacramento and with Keegan Murray and just given what Keegan Murray means to the Kings over the next five to eight to 10 years and, and possibly beyond is that DeMar DeRozan showing up would like, oh, hey, he's just, he's going to take a further backseat than he already did. And that's kind of my, he's just not going to grow at all over these three. But it, you bring up that point where, okay. Maybe, maybe this year he's just kind of the player he was last year. You see the points tick up because I think he's going to shoot it better. I think he's better than a, what was he, 35.8% last year from three? Uh, can, oh, yeah. Something can. like that. Yeah, I, yeah. I think he, he's just, he's a better shooter than that. So I think you see the numbers tick up there, but I don't think necessarily the volume's going to tick up. But I would think that playing with DeMar DeRozan for two, three years gets you in a space where, hey, I see the areas of the floor he can operate in. And the way he attacks the game and different ways that Keegan can take that, where by year two or by the end of year three, he's really grown into the into that player that the Kings kind of need him to be. And that was my Yeah. You've quelled the concern. I think, yeah, your question is like a very good question and it's very warranted because like the entire when you bring in a player like this, the the initial concern should always be what implications does that mean for everyone else around him? Mm-hmm. And I think De'Aaron Fox has done a really good job of like saying, hey, do you guys understand that all of these teams that are throwing the the Jaden McDaniels at me, the the mm-hmm. long, super athletic wings, mm-hmm. they now have to throw that guy at, at DeMar as well. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to be able to get loose. I, I think that when you hear DeMar talk about the Boston Celtics and say, hey, look, the Boston Celtics, Celtics just won the NBA championship with superstars at every position. Like, mm-hmm. what are we talking about here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we can figure it out. I no mean, doubt. if you if you can think of a team that can literally replace Al Horford, who barely scores at all in the starting lineup, with Chris Stapp's Porzingis, and they they don't just get better, they go and win an NBA championship, Yeah. then why would you think it's not going to work here, where mm-hmm. we're adding a player who knows how to score? And, I, it, like... I think the other thing is the playmaking, like his ability to get to the foul line. Yeah. All of these things are, are like desperate things that the Kings needed. I asked Malik Monk, um, uh, on media day, how cool it is. Like Malik Monk took it personal that they lost last year, that they didn't make the playoffs. And he took it personal because he knew that if he was there, if Luca hadn't fallen on his knee, there's a good chance they would have made the playoffs and that they wouldn't have been a play in team. And even if they were a play in team, they would have much better chance of winning with him than without him. And it's because he's a hooper. And when he's sitting there on the bench watching his team play, he can see the the giant gap that is missing when he's not on the court. Mm-hmm. He can see that they don't have the playmaking ability to to make it. That they're struggling. That like it's nothing against what Keon Ellis is as a player. That's not who he that's not how the, not his role. It, it's not his role and it's not where he's going to thrive. Yeah. Right. So when you add another piece like this, and I asked Malik about this, it, yeah, Malik's looking at like, yes, we, it was clear we needed someone like this, this mm-hmm. not just a playmaker for himself, not just a scorer, but a guy who gets to the free throw line seven, eight times a game, mm-hmm. and a guy who, who not only that, but averages over five assists per game. So when you say you don't think that Keegan Murray's like shots per game could go up, his, mm-hmm. his three point shots. Man, look at all the attention that Sabonis Fox and DeMar DeRozan sure. are going to draw. If Keon mm-hmm. Ellis is starting and if uh, Keegan Murray are starting, 
look at all the wide open looks they're going to get from the corner, mm -hmm. from the top of the key. It's just going to be like catch and shoot paradise. Yeah. Even for a guy like Kevin Herter, when he when he's healthy and when he's back in the rotation, like this is a catch and shoot dream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it, uh, you know, we we saw who was it that we saw that uh, it was George Yang, right? Mm -hmm. Got super upset with Ben Simmons. He he went out and like. They, they asked him about dragged us out. So he, he dragged him right because he said look look i went to philadelphia because i'm a catch and shoot player and i don't create for myself and i yeah. went there to catch and shoot from ben simmons because he's an incredible creator right and i sat there and was so excited to play with him and mm -hmm. then the dude just decides he doesn't want to play he's yeah. like so bleep that guy that i mean that's where he was like I, and i think he like go, he just went off yeah you want well, in on Ben Simmons? That was nuts. Yeah, but look at what like guys like Keon, guys like Keegan, guys like Kevin Herter, guys like Trey Lyles should be looking at this, going, "Oh my gosh, look mm -hmm. at all the attention that these other three guys are going to draw." Even Malik Monk, how much attention Malik Monk is going to draw? How many open three point looks Malik Monk will get is going to be wild. I don't doubt. I don't doubt the the open looks, and that's why I said I think Keegan's going to shoot way better than thirty five point eight. Way better. Yeah, it was forty one point one as a as a rookie. I think he probably gets back up closer to that number. Yeah. Um, but really, he shot six point six threes a game last year. I don't think you're going to see a significant uptick in volume. He needs eight at least. No, he does. <laughs> if he gets eight. That which is what one point two, he just gets one point four, one point four more attempts per game, and let's say he bumps his his three point shooting up four percent, just think how many more points per game he's going to average. Buddy, you're asking me to do a level of math that I don't have for you. It's a lot. <laughs> I just tell you, it, he he has a potential to average two or three more points per game. Just yeah, that's what I was. That's a, yeah, yeah, sure. Like he could easily get to eighteen points a game this season with shooting 1.4 more attempts from behind the arc. Okay. You don't just want that to be who he is, so you want him that's to be what, more. Right, and that's right. And that's that's what I, I guess that's that's uh, now we're we're talking in circles a little bit, but that's kind of what I'm talking about. Uh-huh. Is I just I think you're if Keegan is catch and shoot guy, I just feel like you're limiting him as a player. You are. You and are. that's and that that was the the crux of my my worry. Is man, hey, are you limiting Keegan Murray and what he's going to be, and and over the next two or three years? But as you bring up, yeah, hey, you probably get a little bit less from Demar Derozan. You get a little bit more from Keegan Murray, and in the meantime, he's getting to learn uh, how to score at different levels from from one of the best second level scorers of all time. Yeah, yeah. What do you got? I, I think that there are a lot of potential. No, we're You're good? okay. Okay, yeah, we're okay. I think there's a, a lot of potential for him to grow as a player, but quietly grow where it's not like everyone is saying, "Hey, man." Why are you not sh taking more shots? Why are I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's okay, though. You got, got De'Aaron Fox and Malik Monk and DeMar DeRozan and Demona Sabonis running around. And I'm like, I need my Keegan jumpers. But we just took away <laughs> the the reason why you need more. Keegan. Yeah, no, I know. I, I'm, I'm yeah. totally with that. I'm yeah. totally with that. Like I said, I'm, I am on board the Kings making the playoffs this year. Uh, I am. I think I saw it. Was it Hoops Hype? Had him at like 46 and 36 again. Like I'm off that. Like no, I think they're winning fifty plus, as long as they're healthy. No, I I'm in the same hoops hype. Is that true? Hoop? No, true, true. No. Hoop? Who was it that had it? No, I think it was. Probably I think it was the true hoop guy. Oh, doctor, whatever. Oh, was it? Uh, oh, I forget. His it name. wasn't. It wasn't David Thorpe. David Thorpe, that's him. Okay, is he true hoop? Yeah. Okay, then yeah, him. Well, that's the David easy. Thorpe is the name. That's the easy pull. I mean, that's like if you're doing the averages, the laws of averages, like you're going to say, OK, 46 wins. You're going to say 47 for this team, 46 mm -hmm. for this, 45 for for this team. We're going right, to because drop down nobody to predicts nobody predicts big jumps without John Morant coming back for the Grizzlies. Yeah, like that's nobody's going to. So I just I wanted to make it very clear. Well, these are the little weird things I worry about. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still very much on board with the Kings being a 50 win playoff team. Yeah, it, it's definitely it's good to have those worries and those concerns because they're they're really good talking points and, and discussion points. Uh, all right. Speaking of talking points and discussion points, that's James Hamlin, Kyle Mads, and we're sponsored by Jiffy Lube. The show is called The Insiders. We hang out every day from 10 to noon right here on ESPN 1320. 
uh, talking a ton of Sacramento Kings, obviously. Hope you will uh, stick with us. Um, the shooting guard, I guess, position battle. Mm -hmm. It feels over based on, like, look. So Mike Brown yesterday, uh, you had the quote. Right now, well, well tell me, he told uh, a different outlet that Keon was the starter. That was the, the murmur yesterday was that Keon is a starter for now. Right. Because Kevin's hurt because, you know. like Right. So he said yesterday, right now, Keon has a shot, but that's mainly because Kevin is out. And as time goes on, it will work itself out. So I'm not necessarily concerned about it. Keon is there right now, but that for sure can change. I want to put Malik Monk off to the side for a second because I want to discuss him separately from the Keon Ellis, Kevin Herter of it all. Yes. If this is the case... Given the timeline that we currently have for Kevin Herter, Keon Ellis is your starting two guard on night one. He might be the starting two guard on night one, but he also could not be the starting two shooting guard on game three. I mean, I, that's kind of the way that I read this is huh. that like the, the competition is still open and it's, it's open because Kevin Herter has over his career proven that you know, he, he deserves at least a, a consideration in this conversation, right? Uh, we're talking about a guy that over 134 games as a Sacramento Minnow King, mm -hmm. as a starter, uh, the team is 78 and 56. You know, they're 18 games over 500. And so for me, uh, is that what that? No, 22 games over 500. Um, that's a big deal. And Kevin Herner was a very, very valuable member on the breakout team that won 48 games. He was a third leading scorer on that team. Yeah. He just did not have a good season last year. And if he was 29 years old and you're going to phase him out, that's one thing, but he's not, he's like 25, 26 years old. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of owe it to yourself. You have him under contract for two years, uh, to, to not close the door, but also in training camp, to not put all of this pressure on Kevin Herter to get back today. Exactly. And if you're not here tomorrow, then Keon's going to be the starter and you're out. Mm -hmm. That's not what you need to do as a coach. It's not your job. And yeah. so I felt like Mike may have backtracked over what he said the day before, although I didn't hear the exact statement that he made yeah, the yeah. day before the way it was represented was very specific. Um, but I also, I, I, I asked that follow up because I wanted to know like, what does it mean? And I think Keon is like the feel good story of the world uh, in Sacramento because he's a guy who goes undrafted and of course. and all of a sudden gets a two way contract and all of a sudden uh, fights his way through the G League and all of a sudden it makes the team out of training camp last year, which wasn't even a guarantee. But yeah. as a two way player, he didn't go to Stockton. He didn't get sent down. He stayed with the team the entire year, which was not expected at walking into training camp. And then when you had players get injured. He steps right into starting roles in one of the one the first eight or nine games where he was a starter, and so there's all these little things that he's doing that uh, kind of show you that he might be a ball player. But as a coach, as an organization, you're always like a little bit concerned about it. Yeah, I mean, you have one player who's making 17, 18 million bucks a year, mm -hmm. and you have another player who's on a rookie scale minimum second year. Uh, this is his first full mm -hmm. season yeah. under an NBA contract. I just I I. Let's hang on. Let's let's put a pin in this. I want to I want to keep discussing this and we'll get to the Malik Monk uh, and where he fits in uh, in the starting two guard conversation, because honestly, this is a conversation I think that's going to go kind of throughout the season. No, oh, I agree. There's just so much like in the NFL, when a position battle happens, typically whoever wins that position battle is just going to be the starter unless it's a disaster. Right. Yep. In the NBA, like coaches tweak their rotations and stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. You have 82 games to to figure it out for the playoffs. So uh, I think this discussion will be ongoing, but I want to I want to I want to keep doing that. I will have some Devonte Adams trade stuff as well on the insider sponsored by Jiffy Lou. He's James Ham. I'm Kyle Madsen. Uh, we'll be back in a second on ESPN 1320 at Sacramento Sports Center. Still building the stacks. No, I just broke a little bit earlier. Oh. Oops. Fine, it's not the end of the world. Um, yeah, David, uh, do I think Trey regains his form when he gets back? I hope so. 
Uh, I think Trey Lyles is a tremendously important player. Um, the 48 win season, very specifically, there's like six games during the season, which I believe the Kings would have lost if Trey Lyles didn't step on the court. And I, I honestly felt that way. There were so many times where I thought that he stepped on the court and instantly started hitting a couple of threes and got a couple of big rebounds and quietly just like was so incredibly impactful in a game. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I hope that he regains his form because um, I'll tell you, like NBA coaches, they they beg their teams to make sure they have as many stretch fours as they possibly can, guys who can shoot the ball from uh, a center or power forward position because that's the modern NBA and it changes everything. And um, that's a big deal. So Trey is that guy for this team, and hopefully he, he gets back soon and, and is healthy. I agree with this, although Minnesota is a totally different team this year. And I still think Trey is a great matchup with, uh, with Julius Randle. Oh. <sighs> Let's see. Soren, I don't know that... I don't think that there's anyone who doesn't want to start Soren... Uh, 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 key on Ellis except for maybe Kevin Herter uh but there's also sort of it's more complicated than that it, it, it always is like teams are complicated and we'll get into the discussion more here in a minute because uh, I, I think there's always nuance to things and and we'll try to live in the nuance how about that Yeah, Jalen, the the Kings have three games against Minnesota before uh, the last game is November 25th. That's crazy because that team is going through a major upheaval right now. And we don't even know what kind of, what that upheaval is going to have, what kind of impact that upheaval is going to have on that team. Um... We interviewed Isaiah Crawford, Mark, um, at Media Day. Here we go. Hour number two, that's James Ham. I'm Kyle Matz, and we are sponsored by Jiffy Lube, and we're hanging out with you until noon right here on ESPN 1320. Sacramento's sports leader at noon will hand it off to D'Lo and KC, and they will take you right up to 4 o'clock. Um, we got playoff baseball on this radio station today. Oh. Yeah, we do. Playoffs were fun last night. Um, let me make sure I have the day and times right. Today. Braves at Padres, 5 p.m. The Padres looking to sweep that best of three game series in San Diego. Uh, Fernando Tatis Jr. had a uh, two run shot last night to get things going for the Padres. They won game one of that series, four to nothing. Vibes in San Diego look crazy. Mm, yeah, that's a good place to watch. Might, depending on if they make the NLDS, depending on how some things shake out in life, uh, I'm going to have to scoot down to San Diego for a day. Okay. Taking a taking a playoff. I'd like to there. go down and take in a playoff game. That'd be fun. Down a roll, just a little road trip. Uh, that's a long road trip. That's a maybe a flight. Well, <laughs> and I guess um, uh, the, the flights are cheap right now. Flights are cheap right now. The tribal chief walked by. Was he? Just, yeah, he, ignored us totally, which is par for the course. Well, he should ignore us because we just absolutely thumped him oh, in fantasy. This just week. molly whopped him. Yeah, that's right. What did he did he have like the second highest score in the league? Uh those are the worst. 
Um, just so you know, like if you're listening, you're like, hey, we don't care about your fantasy team, but if we win this league, uh, it's drinks on us. So unofficially. Unofficially, James and I are gonna go grab a drink, and we're gonna tell you where we're going. We'll we'll like go to the Pine Cove so we can buy unlimited PBR on tap, and and our money will go further. Kyle, <laughs> um, I'm trying to see how many. I don't know. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go through that. We're talking about the Kings right now. We can get to fantasy football on Friday. Fantasy Friday, ten thirty, with Faraz Siddiqui of Upper Hand Fantasy answering your fantasy football questions. Um, okay, we're talking about the Kings two guard stuff with uh, training camp officially underway. One of the things I can't shake, and I know yesterday I, I, I floated the theory that I'm workshopping that Kevin Herter should start. Yeah. But at the same time, I feel like the Kings captured the identity that Mike Brown has been trying to get them to capture for the first two years or year and a half, year and three quarters that he was their coach. And I don't think it's a coincidence that they started to harness that identity that really intense defensive team i don't think it's a coincidence they started finding that when keon ellis started a playing more and then b starting yeah i i agree 100 it it, it, and and that's what i can't i know what kevin herter does as a shooter and i know I, I made the case yesterday that man if you're getting the best version of him as a starter then you probably need to make him a starter etc cetera, etc cetera. but also if you think demar Derozan is going to help tick up your offense that little bit and you think that what you did with Keon Ellis defensively in the starting lineup is is sustainable for this entire season? Mm-hmm. I don't know how you go away from that. I just don't know how I, I don't know how you could justify that if your entire ethos as a coach, as it is with Mike Brown, is like, hey, defense, defense, defense. Yeah, I agree with you 100. percent It it, but again, these things like we talked about this on the break at, during the break. Like you have to live in the nuance of this, right? It, you can't just say, hey, look because Keon Ellis stepped on the court, they were better defensively. There's also at the same time that Keon Ellis gets a huge opportunity late in the season. There's a moment where, again, Malik Monk steps off the court and misses a bunch of time. And and that's not me calling out Malik Monk as a bad defender or anything. I think Malik Monk can be a pretty mm-hmm. solid defender. What I'm saying, it, the entire dynamic of the game changed. Like the Kings became a slower paced team. They became like a more plotting team and a more defensive minded team down the stretch of the season, mm-hmm. almost out of necessity because they didn't have one of their most dynamic playmakers. Sure. Right. So like all of these things change. Uh, but what we can say is that, that the Kings were not a good defensive team uh, the year before they were one of the worst defensive teams They're 25, mm-hmm. 26 in the league in defensive rating. Then last year they took a, a leap forward, but they were just kind of like stuck at a certain point. And, and basically what we saw was that like, as the, the season progressed, the Kings had one glaring problem that they could not figure out. And that was how to stop other teams from shooting the three point shot. Yeah. Like even when, if they it were, it was uncanny. Yes. Worst three point shooting team in the league. Are oh, they going to make 26 of 40? They're going to set their, like, their franchise record for most makes in a, and, I swear to God, like five franchises did that against the Kings last year. Yeah, and, and a little bit of that is a self fulfilling prophecy, right? You go up against a team that that doesn't isn't a good defensive team against the three point shot. So you come into the game game planning to shoot more threes. You come in with more confidence to shoot threes because that team's not good at the three ball. So there, it becomes again a self fulfilling prophecy. But at the same time, when you put Keon Ellis on the court, the team like skyrocketed like defensively, Mm -hmm. like, and when you heard Mike Brown talk about it, like coming out of the break, if we were just a a top eight team in defending the three point line, we would, our defensive rating would go from where it's at to top 12, top 14, Mm -hmm. whatever it might be. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. They put Keon Ellis on the court. The the defensive rating went plummeted. Like they were so much, which is good. You want your defensive rating to be low. Yeah, so, I mean, they just became so much better defensively right away. And, you know, I, I asked De'Aaron about this yesterday, about playing alongside Keon. He said, look, uh, if you want to read more about it, you can go to thekingsbeat.com, and I, I wrote about it yesterday, and, nice. and you can you can read all about what Good I wrote. Plug. Um, but uh, De'Aaron very specifically said, like, the second he stepped on the court as a rookie, you knew he knew how to play defense. You understood that his defensive like mm-hmm. instincts were better than most of the other people on the court. Yep. He just has a knack for getting through a screen 
going over the top, going underneath the screen. When he goes under a screen, he doesn't get hung up on the screen and he slides right back into place. He can block a shot going underneath the screen on a three point shot. Mm -hmm. That is unheard of. And the other thing I would point out, it's not what Keon Ellis does. doesn't just impact like the guy he's defending it. It impacts everything. And so we had De'Aaron Fox, who is always been a, a league average to slightly above league average defender, but with potential to be a great defender and a potential mm -hmm. to be an outstanding steel guy through the first half of the season. He, he does fine steel wise in October. He has four steals. November. He has 14 steals and nine games in December. He has 24 steals and 13 games, January, 22 steals and 15 games. Jeez. You put in February, you put Keon Ellis into the rotation full time. You put him into a starting lineup for part of these games in February in 11 games, 34 steals, almost over three steals a game in March, 15 games. De'Aaron Fox had 35 steals. Golly. We're talking about, you know, 2.3 steals per game in April in eight games. He had 17 steals. He leads the league in steals. And you know mm -hmm. why he leads the league in steals? Because the on ball pressure that Keon Ellis is, is do is putting on mm -hmm. his guy is making bad passes from the other team that De'Aaron Fox is feasting on mm -hmm. as one of the fastest players in the league. Yeah. And so he's just like, oh my gosh, look at that lollipop. I'm going to go steal it and go for a dunk. Mm -hmm. Again and again and again. And so I really do think, like, look, we can talk about fit versus best player. Mm -hmm. I think that Kevin Herter has proven himself to be a really, really good NBA player. And Keon Ellis has yet to prove that he's a really good NBA player. Kevin Herter is a better player. It's why he makes 17 or 18 million bucks. Mm -hmm. And it's not why Keon Ellis only makes 2 million. He only makes 2 million because he had to fight his way into the league. Right. right? And there will be a point where Keon Ellis gets paid. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is that sometimes fit is way more valuable and way more important than who's a better player. Mm -hmm. And that's where I keep coming back with this team. It's, you know, I, I get what Mike's saying. And I don't know if Mike is given, you know, telling us, this to make sure that Kevin Herter hears that it's still an open competition. Mm -hmm. That could very well be the case. But I will tell you that if you're going to have four great offensive players on the court to start a game, including DeMar DeRozan, De'Aaron Fox, Montes Simonis, Keegan Murray, somebody has to play, somebody like primary job mm -hmm. is to do the dirty work and to hit wide open threes mm -hmm. and to play defense. Yeah. And that is more Keon Ellis than yeah. it is Kevin Herter. And that's not Kevin Herter's fault. It's just the dynamics of change in Sacramento. It would look a lot different is if instead of DeMar DeRozan, you went out and got Mikhail Bridges and sure. he's a great defender. Mm -hmm. Now it's okay to have a Kevin Herter next to him. Right. The but, offensive version of Keon Ellis kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it just becomes like, like team building is very complicated. Yeah. And, and I'm glad that I'm not the one who has to make these decisions. No doubt. And especially because I'm going to make them on the radio, though. Yeah, that's right. So I, it, but it's complicated because, you know, like how many times have we seen a position battle play out? And like they're, you know, my first year we had Dante Green versus Omri Caspi. And it really became like this, this really weird. It's during the Twilight era. So it's like Team Jacob versus Team. um, What's his name? Robert Pattinson. Yeah. Uh, Robert, Edward. Edward. Yeah, Edward versus... So it becomes like, oh, there's these two warring factions. Someone's going to win. Dante Green started game one. The next nine games went to Omri Caspi. At game 11, Paul Westwell's like, okay, everyone keeps saying, like, uh, whatever, I, I need to try something different. He put Jason Thompson at the small forward spot. Hell yeah. Like, that's... Like, sometimes that's how it plays out. I don't think that's how this is going to play out. Yeah. I think someone is going to win the starting job. I think they're going to be there for quite a while. Yeah. And uh, depending on how the team does, if it's Keon Ellis in that starting lineup and the team is winning, that is the only thing that matters. That's it. it that's is. it. But if they start two and six, then something might change. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the logical kind of inflection point with the lineup. Uh, but on the, on the related to the, to the two guard thing, um, I also wonder because somebody in the in the chatty house at youtube.com slash ESPN 1320, uh, somebody in the chatty house brought up, well, their their defensive identity changed when the league changed how they blew the whistle. Okay. And I think that's I think that's an interesting point because I, I do wonder, does that stick this year? 
or is all of a sudden uh, the ball pressure that that Keon Ellis is playing with is going to earn him uh, foul trouble early in games? Same with, same thing with De'Aaron Fox. Like De'Aaron Fox, when when he when he got went to defend somebody and just got in their jersey, right? He generated a lot of steals like that because, in part, because there's Keegan Murray and Keon Ellis behind him. It's not a disaster if if the 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 point of attack breaks down, but I also think that there was an uptick in physicality that was allowed by the league, mm-hmm. which is not breaking news. Everybody saw it happen. I'm so fascinated to see, uh, you know, the Kings obviously is what we're discussing, but just from a league wide standpoint, how they officiate games to start the year, because okay. I think that could, I think that could play a role in, in how well the Keon Ellis starting lineup continues to work. Okay, I agree that there was a, a massive change. Like mm-hmm. I've never seen the league do anything like this it in was all my time covering. Insane. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. It's like every time they you walk into a season, they do points of emphasis. We watch a video, they tell us these are points of emphasis. Please don't tweet about them, but these are the points of emphasis for this season. You get through like six, seven games of the season, points of emphasis go out the window. Just gone. Sometimes they last a little bit longer and it's just annoying, but most <laughs> of the time it doesn't. Like, hey, nobody asked for carrying to be called more. Yeah, nobody like, asked for that. Yeah, nobody asked for the carrying thing to happen. Uh, the the players stopping short, you know, like pulling yeah, the yep. uh, George Costanza's dad, like, you yeah. know, the Steph Curry, the, Trey Young, just yeah, walking get the in player on your hip and then stop. stopping. Yep. Right. Yep. Uh, they like they learn very quickly. Hey, you're not going to get the calls. So just move on. Um, but the uh, I would just point out, Kyle, that it wasn't just the Kings that had to play in the new rules. And when you have a team who's, let's say, 17th in defensive rating and the league changes the rules and you finish the league, the the final 25 or 30 games of the season as like the number eight defensive team in the league. Sure. And you drop your defensive rating all the way to number 13. Mm-hmm. That means that you figured out the new rules and mm-hmm. a bunch of other teams didn't. So you could say that all of a sudden the Kings just started playing harder defense. Or you can look at it and say, and they put in Keon Ellis. And mm-hmm. so so there, sure. everyone had to play under those same rules. Not everyone's defensive rating improved by like nine spots. Yeah. And and that's just a reality. So I, I get it that yeah, the rules change, but the rules change for everyone. Yeah. And so I, I think it's intriguing though. It's a great conversation because like at the end of the day, like <clears throat> Mike Brown, you said it in the beginning. Keon Ellis is a is the type of player that that Mike Brown loves. Mm-hmm. He loves that type of player. Yeah. And he and it's because he's coached those types of players, you know, when he's in Golden State, it's uh, Gary Payton the second, mm-hmm. right? When he was with Greg Popovich in San Antonio, it, it's Bruce it Bowen. The entire team. <laughs> it's the entire team. But no, but look at it's Andre Iguodala. It's yeah, yeah. it's uh, again Bruce Bowen. It's these guys that are unheralded, but they do so much to what the only thing that matters, mm-hmm. and the only thing that matters is winning. Yeah, and and so if people's feelings get hurt or if a general manager wastes money on a player that isn't going to play a bunch. It it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, if the the win column keeps yeah, calling, that's it. That's all that matters. And so it's on Mike to find the guy that's going to help you win the the most games. Yeah. And and whoever he thinks that that is, he might be wrong. Mm-hmm. And then it might take a little while to change. But but at the end of the day, that's what really should matter. So let's loop in now the player that we have not really talked about yet in this starting shooting guard discussion and bring in Malik Monk Mm. because there are, uh, I think, a a large, a large portion of Kings fans. I don't want to say a majority. There's a large portion of Kings fans. I believe D'Lo and KC, which is coming up at noon right here on ESPN 1320. I believe they're in this camp as well that Malik should just start. Why would you not start your five best guys? Mm -hmm. Um, I get it. I don't I I think that for me I, I would prefer Malik Monk off the bench, just given what they can do rotationally with that. And it sounds like Mike Brown is in that same camp. Yeah, I mean Mike Brown is not to ha- brag. Has coached in in the NBA for a long time mm-hmm. and for alongside two of the greatest coaches we've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Right. Greg Popovich, uh in a small market. Uh, people keep telling me San Antonio is a big market now. It's still not a big market. Yeah, it just whatever. It's still one of the smallest NBA markets. And he what Greg Popovich has been able to build as a dynasty there in San Antonio is incredible. Steve Kerr, 
what he was able to build as a dynasty here in down the street in Golden State, absolutely incredible. And both of those coaches have always reserved a player that can that gives you pop. Mm-hmm. That's what it pop off the bench is how Mike describes it. And it it doesn't matter how good that player is. It doesn't matter how if he really really wants to start. And I love that Mike continues to compare Malik Monk to Manu Ginobili. And like for years, Manu Ginobili was the second best shooting guard in the NBA. It was awesome. Behind Kobe Bryant. And he came off the bench. Mm -hmm. And the Warriors and Spurs won eight championships with those guys on the roster. Seven of those, according to Mike, seven of those came with Andre Iguodala or uh, or Bruce Bone, I mean, uh, Manny Ginobili off the bench, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And that's, sometimes it, it's, again, this is about team building. It's about how, uh, it's about opportunity. It's about how a, a guy being the, the leader off the bench will get more Got shot it. attempts than he would as the fourth or fifth option with the starting lineup. And people can say, how is Malik Monk going to be the fourth option of, on the Kings starting lineup? Mm-hmm. Uh, because DeMar DeRozan, DeMar Sabonis, and De'Aaron Fox exist. And so what you don't want to do is take away from those guys to give to someone else when you can have that someone else come off the bench, get more opportunity for himself, and those other guys get more opportunity in the starting lineup. Yeah. So I think it's really interesting that not only does Mike bring up the uh, the Manu comparison, but he brings up Bruce Bowen in that comparison again and again. And he brought mm-hmm. up yesterday Bruce Bowen, Averaged six points a game for his career and shot 39.3% from three. One of the best defenders that the league has seen, Mm -hmm. right? And and he started while Manu Ginobili came off the bench. And then there's also this moment last season where he compared Keon Ellis to Bruce Bowen and their ability to fight through screens Mm -hmm. and their ability to hit the three-point shot. And he's not saying that Bruce Bowen, uh, that Keon Ellis is Bruce Bowen, but there's only a few players that remind him of him, the way that he moves through a screen. Like it, it's the pieces start to fall in place of what, what Mike's vision is mm-hmm. that we're, we might see play out. And so I'm intrigued by it, but I think people who want to see Malik Monk start, that's okay because you got to love Malik Monk. Yeah. Everyone loves Malik Monk, right? Sure. That guy doesn't pay for a meal in Sacramento or a round of golf. But that that doesn't mean that he's not in the right position for him. He's got paid. He can go have a Hall of Fame career if he wants. If he if he does the right things and he becomes the next man in Ginobili, he definitely can have that type of impact on this this city. He can be, you know, again, like Bobby Jackson, one of the most beloved kings of all time, was a six man. Mm -hmm. And you need that type of player on your team in order to be great. And so uh, I, I think it's interesting, but I also think Mike has kind of closed that door for now and said, this is who Malik is going to be right now. And if that changes at some point, it does. But building a team is more than about appeasing one player. It's more than making fans, you know, like appeasing fans who want to see the five best yeah, players yeah. on the court. You'll see him to end games. Yeah. He'll close. He'll close games. And that's the other thing Mike says. It doesn't matter who starts. It matters who, who finishes. Right. And and at the end of the day, there's a good chance that Malik Monk is in the starting five, is in the closing five. Right. Every single game. Yep. Unless you have a player who is unstoppable and you need Keon Ellis to go out and stop him. How many six man of the year awards did Manu Ginobili win? Two. I'm stuck on a basketball reference page now. We'll continue the Kings discussion in a second. Two? A uh, one. One. How many times was he an all star? I don't know. Twice. Twice. And they were both years that he was a starter. 04, 05, he started all 74 games. In 2010, 11, he started 79 of 80 games. Hey, man, it takes it That's takes crazy. sacrifice to win, though. And the the only thing that I think matters to... Two things matter to Manu and Ginobili. Number one is that he's got four rings. And number yeah. two is that he has a, a gold jacket just like everybody else. Mm-hmm. Like he's a Hall of Famer, yeah. and he's not a Hall, Hall of Famer as the, a European. Uh, well, maybe he is on the European boat. It doesn't matter. He would have been a Hall of Famer either way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He definitely would have. Um, it's more about to to just now. I'm nitpicking. 
but it's what he did at the end of his career. It was the sacrifice he made at the end of his career where at age 34, it was clear like, Hey, this guy's still got it. Mm -hmm. Like this guy can still, but instead of going off elsewhere and being like, no, I'm going to start. He went to the bench and you mentioned it, the four rings extended the number of rings he got by going to the bench later in his career. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where the, the sacrifice really comes in. Um, yeah, <laughs> Malik Monks turns into Mount Ginobili. The the Kings are in a are in a really good spot. Um, so you think there's no chance he starts? As of right now, the table. Uh, like I don't know if your head coach is just going to keep bringing up that he wants you coming off the bench. Like again, uh, whatever they did to get Malik Monk to sign that contract, mm-hmm. it did not come with a promise that he would start. And the fact that he wants to start, mm-hmm. it's okay. Like, he should want to start. He should want to play 30 minutes a game. Like, I think the biggest thing for Malik is to show that he can play 30 minutes a game, mm-hmm. even in that super sub role. Yeah. And, and, like, look, he's so valuable to this team. And I know somebody uh, called, asked him about the shooting guard position. And he said, I, well, I don't consider myself shooting guard. If he was, well, and if he was that concerned with starting, mm-hmm. I don't know that he would have come back. If that was his ultimate goal was to be an NBA starting point guard or shooting guard. Yeah. I don't think he probably would have come back to Sacramento. I think by looking at how the how it played out, I think we can make a list. There, there are three things that were happening here. Number one, money. Yep. Number two, the starting job. And number three, playing where he's comfortable, his mm-hmm. NBA home. Mm-hmm. And I think he, at the end of the day, he considered all of those three things and he probably put them in a in a little on a piece of paper which one is more important to me and while money is the one that kept sliding up to the top and saying i need to get paid at the end of the day that's not what he chose well because there was more money out there he chose his nba home over the biggest payday and then the last one is going to be that other that other piece, which well, is being a starter. There was going to be money either way. It was, does role and comfort, is that worth $4 million a year or whatever? Yeah. Over over the next five years. And winning, I think, was probably in there as well. Mm-hmm. Is not winning, potentially being uncomfortable in the new place, and um, starting, are all of those things worth 4 or $5 million a year? Yep. And he decided no. Uh, last thing, real quick. Do the Kings consider Kevin Herter's trade value in any of this? Because I operated all offseason like, okay, well, Kevin Herter's not going to be on the team next year. And alas, here he is. And and uh, barring something insane, he's going to be on the on the team for the foreseeable future. Is that something you think they're taking into consideration when it comes to his minutes, his role? I think it always has to be. Uh, because, mm. like, look in the grand scheme of of building a basketball team like if the kings need to make a move at midseason the the easiest way to make that move is is using kevin herter's salary right that right? that's like that's straight up and just to, that's why his name comes up yeah it's i'm not trying to be disrespectful to yeah kevin this herter. is not right we're not trying to kick kevin herter out it's just the reality of team building no no it's totally it's yeah. totally the reality i mean he's under contract for 2 years and like you still have to worry about that. Mm-hmm. What you can't do is have Kevin Herter become a non-factor because yes. he either doesn't understand or he's not happy with his role so bad that it becomes like a major issue mm-hmm. and he becomes a drag on the team. And mm-hmm. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think Kevin's that guy. It doesn't seem like it. I think he had a really difficult season last year. And when you started to take away things like starting jobs and stuff, I think it just exasperated exacerbated the situation, mm-hmm. made it worse, made him feel even like in a darker hole. Yeah. And he's hopefully he's through that. And so now it's like, how do I help the team? Mm -hmm. What's the best position he would love to start? But I also think that there's a tremendous amount of value that can be raised in Kevin Herter as a guy who makes his career like Kyle Korver did. As a guy just comes in, it's just lights out shooter off the bench. Yeah, Uh, there's a tremendous role in the NBA for that type of player. And if you can be that and you could also potentially be a starter, and if you can prove that you can be a starter not only at the two, but potentially at the three, mm-hmm. like look, and there could be injuries and Kevin Herter could be needed. Like there's all kinds of things that are still in play here. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I just have a hard time believing that Mike Brown is gonna look down his bench. Let's say Keon Ellis is a starter. Mm-hmm. And let's say Kevin Herter's just not not playing a ton. They've fallen into a nice rotation. They're eight and two to start the year. I can't imagine Mike Brown 
is going to go, oh, shoot, Kevin's trade value. Let's mess up our rotation and get him in the game. No. I can't fathom that. I, I get it. I get it. <laughs> I but you at least have to consider all things. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's that's in the, the discussion. Things. That's part of the discussion when they have their. Yeah. In my in my head, there's like a big powwow once a week or something. You have to live in the, the nuances. And coaching staff. Right. And like all of this is part of the they nuance team of, meetings, of the like discussion. What's going on outside our window. Right there's now. a team meeting that we're not yeah. invited to. It looks like a little town hall with uh, Aaron, the tribal chief. Oh, OK. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to go. I, you bet I'm going to storm out there right now and see what the heck's going on. You go for it. I'm going to go find out what the heck's going on. And then you and I will find out what the heck is going on with Devontae Adams down in Las Vegas. Is he going to be with the Raiders by next week? Hmm, doesn't look like it. We'll talk about it next. That's James Hamlin, Kyle Madsen. We're the insider sponsored by Jiffy Lube on ESPN 1320 Sacramento Sports Center. Find out what the hell is happening. What is happening? I love that Kyle is is like into this. Because then he reports to me because I'm not. What? what? Into what's happening. I know you're you're not like fully into it, but you're into it. Oh, I care more than I should. Yeah. I don't give up. Um let's see. What do we have? Uh thanks, Lizzie. We can fly with the blue hoodie. Uh Luca did uh has a calf contusion. Uh, it's not a calf strain, though. Calf strain, I'd be concerned that he might be out, you know, sometime. Calf contusion means he got kicked. Um, he got a bruise. Uh, he'll be out for like a month. Uh, I, I mean, a week. Uh, they're going to reevaluate him in a week. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mark, you asked about Isaiah Crawford. Isaiah Crawford was at camp yesterday. Uh, I mean, at, uh, at camp yesterday for sure, but at media day. Uh, he seems like a really good kid and, um, I don't, I didn't get a really close look at him, uh, during the California classic, like up close and because I got sick during the California classic. Um, what happened during the California classic? What do you mean? What happened? I, I had some sort of basketball played. No, I had some sort of illness and missed two games. Um, Yes, either way. Uh, so I didn't get to meet him in person a bunch during the California Classic. It looks like the Kings have stacked on the weight on that kid. He is one of the kids that looks absolutely ripped. And you're like, holy cow. Um, I don't know what it means for him. Like, he's going to have to work his way through the G League. I don't think he'll be a player at all on the Sacramento Kings this year in the same way that um, uh, Jalen Slauson wasn't a player last year. Uh, but... I, I definitely think there's at least some potential for him to be a player down the road. Um, Uh, I didn't even want a snack. But here I am. These are the most comfortable hoodies of all time. Shout out to to Jim, uh, our guy Jim at uh, Brickhouse Industries. If you guys need anything? Jim at Brickhouse is amazing. He's a great Brickhouse dude. Is incredible. Yeah, absolutely great dude. Um. Yeah, Tyus got stuck in in the middle of something. Uh, like in a in a declining market and he also played last year on a horrible team and it didn't matter what his role was with that team that team was god awful and that also hurts your value also putting the ball in the hoop matters a lot when it comes to contract value it does it matters a ton and Tyus Jones is an awesome point guard that assist turnover ratio is crazy uh -huh. he can shoot it but he's not he's his primary role is not putting the ball in the hoop which no. is why and even like compare, I'll I'll make a good comparison here. Tyus Jones. Let's do this on her. Okay.
Now, back to the Insiders with James Ham and Kyle Madsen, brought to you by Jiffy Lube on ESPN 1320. We'll talk about Devontae Adams because it looks like the Raiders are going to trade the star wide receiver. There's like beef with the head coach. Like Devontae and Antonio Pierce haven't been talking, and then Antonio Pierce is liking Instagram posts about Devontae Adams playing his last game with the Raiders. It's a now uh, Devontae is saying he would prefer to be traded and the Full blown Raiders, chaos. It is it is just uh, the Brandon Ayuk mess that the Niners were in. The Raiders are now in that in that realm heading into week five. We'll talk about that in a second. But somebody in the in the chatty house during the break, if you want to hang out there, youtube.com slash ESPN1320. We don't go to to break. We just hang out. We're just around. We're here the whole day. Yeah. Um, and we were talking at the break, and somebody said, Are we sure that Malik Monk was gonna get money elsewhere? Mm-hmm. Tyus Jones signed for the league freaking minimum with Phoenix. And it was it, Tyus Jones, like what's Tyus Jones? Like 28? 28, 29. Yeah. Like he's not he's not in ring chasing mode at this point. No. But Tyus Jones, really good player, got a minimum. Are we sure that and that's a great question. But I think A, the the aprons and such played a role. Yep. Tyus Jones spending last year with Washington and everybody forgetting that he existed probably played a role. Mm-hmm. And then so much of what matters in these in these contracts is A, a Malik is a few years younger. Yeah, Tyus Jones is he's now twenty eight and uh, Malik is 26. But Tyus Jones' value is like, he's going to start for Phoenix. But his value is like s- offensive stabilizer. He's going to distribute a little bit. Give him an open three, he's going to knock it down. He's not going to turn the ball over. Like, he's just going to do the right stuff. Yeah. Malik Monk is like a bucket getter, a scorer, a go-to guy for the Kings, particularly off the bench. And to close games. So when it comes to contracts like that, like that putting the ball in the hoop matters so much. And Tyus Jones was probably deserving of a larger contract than he got, to be sure. Oh, no, for sure. But the difference between what contract was going to be out there for Malik Monk and what contract was out there for Tyus Jones ties back directly to teams looking at Malik and going, hey, that could be like a lead number one scoring guard. Mm -hmm. Whereas Tyus Jones is, eh, it's like a backup point guard who's just not going to turn the ball over. Yeah, I, I mean, a backup or, like, pinch starter. I, like, I'll compare it this way um, in two different ways. Number one, if you look at Tyus Jones today and what he means to the Phoenix Suns, if Keon Ellis starts for the Kings, he's basically the point guard version of Keon Ellis for the Suns. He will be the fifth option. He will be, like, a guy who might average eight or nine points a game. He's not going to make mistakes, and he does, and he plays good defense and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and then the other thing I'll bring up is like, there's this moment where in Matt Harpering's career that he's talked about. Wow. So Matt Harpering, sure. uh, Georgia Tech legend, uh, Utah Jazz, Jazz legend, yeah. Right. So and still, he, I, th- I think he's their analyst on, on their broadcast. Matt Harpering went through his entire career as like a dirty work guy. Everyone knows he's just a hustle guy. He uh, he plays defense. He's feisty. He's rebounding. All this stuff, right? But Matt Harpering had a had a, a contract coming up, and he said to himself, "Hey, how do I get paid?" Mm-hmm. And in that season, he decided to to go all offensive, and he averages like seventeen points a game. Gets a massive extension, mm-hmm. and then when he got that extension, he said, "Okay, I'm going to go back to the player I was," because. That's not who I was last year, and I wasn't very good. Mm-hmm. Just my my offensive numbers look good. That's what gets paid. And that's what gets paid. It's the whole chicks dig the long ball. Mm-hmm. It, it's the home run. It's, you know, Malik Monk averaged over 15 points a game last year. Uh, Tyus Jones started and had unlimited opportunity and averaged 12. There's a ceiling to who he is. And lastly, the player I would compare Tyus Jones to in, in the grand scheme of free agency and everything else is Darren Collison. Mm. It's not Malik Monk. It's not yeah. Lou Williams. It's not uh, uh, Crawford. Um, Jamal Crawford. Jamal Crawford. That's not yeah. who you compare not Jordan him to. Clarkson, yeah. No, it, it's not that. You compare him directly to a player like Jordan, mm-hmm. uh, like uh, Darren Collison, mm-hmm. who is a perfectly fine player, but he mm-hmm. got a what a three-year, $15 million deal in Sacramento um, as opposed to, you know, a, even Isaiah Thomas got a three-year $21 million deal, which was a yeah. ridiculously low amount of money for Isaiah. Isaiah should have got 10 or 12 million bucks a year. And that's sort of the same exact 
Mm-hmm. Like they go into an off season where Malik should have gone. Malik could have made 25 million bucks a year, probably with Orlando or, or Detroit. Mm-hmm. He chose less money. Yeah. To stay in Sacramento. Yeah. All the reporting around it is that there was going to be money out there for him. Yeah. So that's what, um, that's just kind of what it comes down to, man. Yeah. And it, not And that, that sucks because, and frankly, I think it's where NBA teams, like all of them have some shortcomings with their team building. Mm-hmm. Because a player like Tyus Jones, the Suns get him for a league minimum. I completely changed the way I thought about the Suns. Oh, totally. Like just that 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 stabilizing offensive force that takes some of the playmaking going us off Kevin Durant, that takes some of it off of off of Devin Booker, certainly takes some away from Bradley Beal. Mm-hmm. Like, man, that's a that's a really high quality player. But at the same time, if he had gone out and gotten uh let's say 15 million a year from the Pistons, you're like <laughs> What are they paying him fifteen million a year for? He's just yeah. That would have been the cap though. If he would have got twenty, we would have been like, oh my gosh, what in the world is happening? Mm-hmm. That that is one of the worst contracts I've ever seen. Yeah. Um. And then I would also say, crazy. like, I think what's tough is really good player. Some fans look at it and say, hey, look, the the Kings went out and got Jordan McLaughlin at a league minimum deal, and mm-hmm. they got Tyus Jones at a league minimum deal, and it's like there's a big difference, and he's going to play for Phoenix. And he's going to be given a starting, well, he's going to earn, but he he will be the starter most likely for that team at the point guard position because that's what they need. And he's willing to take less money to go play for a team that has no cap space and money mm-hmm. uh, to for the potential to, to maybe win a ring. And what does that look for him next year? Yeah, exactly. Maybe next year is the year he gets his 12, 15 million bucks a year, right? Mm-hmm. Where, I hope he does. Where McLaughlin is, you know, kind of coming into a situation where it's like the $3 million is like, okay, that's kind of who you are as a player. Mm-hmm. And uh, his role will be minimal. And he knows he's coming to Sacramento to be the backup to a guy who plays 35 minutes a night and mm-hmm. is an all NBA caliber player in De'Aaron Fox. Yeah. But, Big difference. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, that was just a conversation we we're having at the break. Yeah. Um, the James Ham and Kyle Madison Show is a podcast. Oh, it is. Subscribe to that. <laughs> I was going to say, if you want more of that conversation, subscribe to the podcast. But the breaks, we don't, are not in the, oh, are not on the podcast. So I had to reroute the way I'm promoting the pod. Okay. The James Ham and Kyle Madison Show, you get it wherever you get your podcasts. It is this show. We break it down by hour and then we send out the full show. So anything you missed, anything you want to revisit, uh, we'll have it for you there at the James Ham and Kyle Madsen Show. We it's the insiders. We just couldn't call it the insiders for legal reasons that were explained to me that I don't remember. Yeah. I gl- as soon as they were like, well, legal said it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't if legal said it, I'm not I am not equipped to argue with them. <laughs> Will they take no uh is an argument? No? Okay, then I'm moving on. <laughs> Lame. <laughs> well, that sucks. Um <laughs> Uh, let's, shift, let's shift gears real quick to uh, to the NFL. So it was reported yesterday at various outlets, Adam Schefter, Ian Rappaport, of ESPN and NFL Network, respectively, saying that Devontae Adams is saying he would prefer to be traded, and the Raiders are now gauging interest around the league. They would like at least a second-round pick, um, or at least that's where the bidding is going to start. And then there's all these teams who could be interested, but... The Chargers and Chiefs, that's probably not going to get facilitated because they're in their division. Does he reunite with Aaron Rodgers with the Jets? There's all, all, all basically any team that could possibly use a receiver is going to call the Raiders about Devontae Adams. Mm-hmm. My question here is not I, 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 if there's actual beef between Devontae Adams and Antonio Pierce and just your best offensive player and your head coach just are never going to get along. Okay, fine. But it seems really clear to me that whatever disconnect is happening didn't just start because it wouldn't be this dramatic right away. If Antonio Pierce liked one thing on Instagram that Devontae Adams didn't like and he went, hey, what the hell? That wouldn't have triggered this response. So this is something deeper to me, which makes me wonder why you, the Las Vegas Raiders, wouldn't have just moved him in the off season. If you were so sure that this wasn't going to work or if the ice was so thin 
that by week four, it's like, hey, this is untenable. He's asked for a trade. We're going to have to move him. I don't, I, I don't, I don't quite understand the logic because we just talked about the, man, get a really gritty win over over Cleveland. You're hanging around, and that's what you can ask him to do this year. Can you can you just hang around? And maybe they think they'll be better without Devontae Adams. Maybe they looked at their offense last week and said, hey, you know what? We can get by without him. Mm -hmm. Get Max Crosby healthy, like what we're doing defensively. Yeah, all right, get him out of here, a little recoup some draft capital. But it just seems to me like if you were that close, what? why was he on the team to begin with? You weren't going to win a Super Bowl this year. So why not get that bidding started in the offseason? Why not get get that bidding started around the draft so you could get some players in to help you now? I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. That's always going to be the question, like timing, the timing of it, like mm -hmm. the value in an NFL contract just goes down, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, I think it's interesting comparing the two, like NBA trades happen all the time and value builds throughout a season for a player because you get to the all-star break and a guy could be having a career year or a guy could be in the final year, uh, months of a contract and you don't know if you're going to be able to retain him. He wants to go test free agency. So you might try to capitalize on his value today worrying about what might happen down the road, right? Mm -hmm. The NFL is so different. Like they build so much about the draft and, and about capital from the draft. And you, you rarely see, like if the Raiders trade Devontae Adams right now, they might get a receiver back, but the level of receiver you're getting back is not going to be anywhere near what his value is. Mm -hmm. And then it just feels like diminishing returns. Like trading a guy right now doesn't, like guys don't step in and like we, we discussed it a little bit like Emmanuel Sanders, right? The, the yeah. 49ers trade for Emmanuel Sanders. He had a good finish to the year, mm -hmm. but he didn't have like an all pro finish to mm -hmm. the year. And that's what Devonte Adams is. He's an all pro level receiver. Yeah, he's one of the best receivers in the league. Yeah. I mean, he could go somewhere and have an impact, but what kind of impact and you need to find a quarterback that he's played with, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I, we're going to hear the jets and the saints like nonstop in this yep. situation. But then you look at the Saints and it's like, okay, you have Olave, you have Rashid Shahid. You look at the Jets, could they use him? Yeah, you know, they have Wilson, but then it's kind of it's kind of bare after that. Mm -hmm. But like it's so like situational. Like wherever he's going to go has to be like a perfect situation for him to like take off and be productive. Sorry, it's a little early. Sorry about that, guys. No, you're good. Uh-oh. I'm walking in the doors and no one knows I'm walking in. Uh, no, you're fine, man. We're okay. You wanted to come in at the start of the segment, we'd be happy. I, I, yeah, I, I love you guys. I was on my way in here early yesterday because I saw him uh, leaving. Yeah, and then I got pulled into an office and talked to. So I oh, didn't get to, oh no, I didn't get to see you guys. Damian oh, okay. Barling, the handoff, D'Lo and KC coming up at uh, noon. Um, hey, I was gonna go to that meeting that was happening outside. Yeah, I was a. I I walked out there to go make a joke. And it seemed like a kind of meeting where I was not going to go make a joke. Did well, I make the right move? Yeah. Okay, yeah, good. This is okay, a good, good week to not make good. jokes during meetings. Got it. Very, okay, very perfect. good week. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Tomorrow, implement the same strategy. Don't make a Bet. joke when everyone is out there, Bet. Uh, including people who aren't normally here. So that's it. that was a good call. Oh, yeah, no, the, um, like the boss boss. Yeah, yeah. But there right, was no – it, 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 there wasn't uh, – it was fine. Like it wasn't. I read like the a, room correctly, though. No, it wasn't a tense meeting or anything like that. We there was just a lot to go over. Like there's a lot happening. Sure. Uh, like aftershock is next week. I just found out I'm going to Disneyland on Monday. Like you'll love that. I'm going to Disneyland on Monday. Or actually, how on does Sunday. everybody at this station get to go to Disneyland except so us? So hold on a second. Not everyone at the station gets to go to Disneyland. Everyone in the building except for this station That's gets what to I go mean. to Disneyland. So what happened is the wake up call on 106.5. Yes, that's this is their thing. They go yes. multiple times a year. It's insane. Gavin is not feeling well. Right. So they have to remove him from the trip because they have to have the trip booked and planned and can't risk him, you know, not being well when the weekend gets here. So Katie asked Complex if I could fill in and kind of take the lead and help her navigate this because Kevin is uh, on a trip to China as well. So um, I'm going in hopes of introducing Disney to the wonderful world of KSFM and ESPN. That way, when the next Disney trip rolls around, our Disney aficionado, Kyle Matson is so, broadcasting live. So I, I told Jackie in promotions, we love Jackie, uh, 
I said, hey, what do I have to do to get 1320 to go to mm -hmm. Disneyland? Yeah. Because you go down there, you like do a yep. show from there. It's, it's, it sounds like a great time. Yeah. She said, we'll just talk about Disneyland on your show. I was like, bet. Yeah. We do that already. You yeah. wore That's a, so easy. a stitch sweatshirt yesterday. I'm wearing a Disneyland hat. No, I right now. Okay, please don't be upset I'm with me. Angry. I'm angry. I going, blame I'm Damien. so mad at I'm you. I'm very literally it's going to work for a fourth radio <laughs> station. So like it's, uh, it's his fault. It's uh, <laughs> it, it, it'll be fun. Yeah. Morning radio is be... back for you, boy. Mm. Is it? It's six a.m. Yeah. You're gonna be. You're gonna do. The We're show. doing the show from six a.m. at Disneyland. Oh, yeah, that's, that's 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 a shoot. How many days? Just one. So we're doing, we're getting there Sunday. Right. You do the park on Sunday. Doing a bunch of content stuff. And uh -huh. then we'll wake up. We'll do the show from six to 10. Oh. And then a bunch of content stuff and then fly back. Sounds great. Kyle. Sounds I, like my. I, I feel worse about ourselves at this yeah. point. Yeah. Hey, she was telling me them, some sort of magic band that we get that like. Oh, yeah. You just, Kyle gets you worse. Just beep in. Yeah. Yeah. It's so it, that's what it does. It's so sick. But he probably gets all the extras. He can just go to any ride and just. You can. That's what she told me. Oh, see. Yeah, you can. Uh, I was really excited to tell you about this. I almost texted it to you, but I was like, no, this will be too good. I have to share it with them in person that I get to go to Disneyland. That's so fun. Kyle's going to punch Damien. <laughs> no, no. I'm happy for my friend that he gets to experience <laughs> I've this. only been once. Did you know? Ever? Really? I've only been once, and it was just on a whim. I was in, I was, I, I, I used to take a yearly trip to like Southern California and just like stay at the beach for the weekend and come back. Mm -hmm. I was doing that and I saw some stories of like some friends who were at Disneyland. I was like, Hey, are you, are you guys in Southern California? Are those like pics from today? She's like, yeah, we're going to Disneyland all weekend. I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm in Malibu. She was like, Oh, pull up. Say less. Cause like her cousins pull worked up. at the park. So she Disneyland. had the whole thing. Oh, great. So I went and, um, did a bunch of rides and then left. Like I didn't spend the whole day and night and all of mm -hmm. that stuff there. Didn't have the full like experience. I just went and hung out for a little bit and left. So this will be the first time ever that I have like a real like Disneyland. Thing. I'm so excited for this. Do you know one of my, my, I'm very, I'm I can't thrilled I'm, to hear this. I can't wait. I have so many suggestions. Um, <laughs> um, at, at some point during the day, usually for me, it's about like 4.30, 5 okay. o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, I go, grab, you can, whether you want to do coffee or whatever juice you bring um, or water or soda or grab a snack or whatever and just find a spot to sit mm -hmm. and just take it in. Like, just, <laughs> just pause. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. <laughs> I don't even know what just happened. It's fine. It's better that you don't. Um, Find uh, a spot to sit yep, and enjoy the park. I got it. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> yep, okay. Throw no, the flag. Uh, Jesse just threw a flag. <laughs> it happened. That's a, uh, Jesse threw that flag through the window. It was flagrant. Um, uh, no, but seriously, like, because you just, you start to notice, like, you're people watching, and you start to notice, like, all these little things that they do within the park that mm -hmm. just make, like, there's music playing the entire time you're there, but you just don't, you don't really like notice it, but it helps the atmosphere. So it's just a really fun thing to do. It's like my favorite thing now that I'm old is I just like to, to sit and enjoy the, the atmosphere. You're not old. Stop it. I'm not, I'm old in Disneyland years. I guess I'll hmm. be ancient in Disneyland. Yeah, there's you know, grandpa I'm out here walking there. around. I'll look great though. I'll tell you that. I'll make sure that I look great. Are you going to wear ears? I think it's mandatory, but cool. we'll see. It's not the easiest thing to put like hats on and off of my hip. I'm very, my, my hair is very, just leave it alone. So sure. once it's done, just leave it alone. Okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll navigate those. I okay. do believe it is a requirement to wear ears. Okay. We can work on that. We'll, yeah, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll get there. about it. Yeah. Okay, I'll, great. I'll, I'll get a t-shirt awesome. and stuff. You want me to bring you something back? I know it's been a Maybe. while since you've been there. Yeah, it's been like two weeks. Yeah, yeah. I'll bring, I'll bring you something <laughs> back. It's changed a lot in the last two years. So I'll, or yeah. last two weeks, I'll bring you something back. Um. Should the Raiders have traded Devontae Adams before the season? Um, that's, I guess in, I guess in hindsight, yeah, probably. Um, I don't think they entered this season believing they're a bad football team. And I don't think they are a bad football team. Sure, I think sure. they're a really bad offense. And we were having this discussion. Yeah, I mean, obviously Kenny was, but Jesse and I really got involved in this discussion about like if you trade 
if you trade Devontae Adams like right now today, it doesn't mean you're throwing in the towel on the season. Mm -hmm. Your offense is already bad, and Gardner Minshew isn't good enough to to make Devontae That's Adams fair. a true weapon. Mm -hmm. So I think the only way that the, the the Raiders are throwing in the towel and going through a true rebuild is if they trade Max Crosby. And there's no hint that anything of like that nature is going to happen. Right. So I guess I guess you 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 should have. I'd argue like right now. The market hasn't changed much. I mean, Pittsburgh wanted Brandon Ayuk. I got to imagine they'd want Devontae Adams. Oh, yeah. The Jets, I'm sure, are still, you know, drooling over the idea of Devontae Adams for their idiotic quarterback. You got and, and then I saw the thing. Uh, I, I didn't I didn't get a chance to like in depthly go into this, but the the uh, the Derek Carr stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The Saints. The Saints. Yeah, like yeah. they're. It's not. It's not like boy, they didn't do it before the the, the season. The, the the market's really shriveled up. No, you got a three and one team mm -hmm. that might be like, hey, we could set ourselves apart if we if we if we get this quarterback or excuse me, if we get this wide receiver. You got a Jets team that they have to win this year. There's no other alternative right. for them. It's like okay, maybe you'd give up a little bit extra uh, th 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 than you might before yeah. to land Devonte Adams. Um, there's a couple of, I mean, the Bills don't even have a, like, really a number one wide receiver. No. I don't know that the Bills can absorb the salary. Yeah, they're in trouble. Yeah, to that's, be, that's, that's more totally your bag frank, than mine, yeah. sure. I, I, I don't, I, I don't I really know do. what they've done since. I know they were up against it. They could trade oh. with the Chiefs. Just think what the Chiefs would give up, but they won't. Yeah, they wouldn't do that in their division. That'd be no. crazy. Well, I just think it, no, I, I, the, I agree, but if it's an offer you can't refuse, you can't refuse it. Yeah, like, Patrick you need Mahomes to be a better football. Well, who says no? You do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I I think it's funny with the Jets how going into this year it was like, well, Aaron Rodgers is back and they're going to win the Super Bowl because Mike Williams and Alan Lazard and Garrett Wilson, he's going to take off. And Brees Hall, wow, he's Christian McCaffrey. Oh, my God. And now they're like, they need help. No, they were never a good enough team and he's not a good enough quarterback anymore. I blame Mike Greenberg. And it's fine. He's 41 years <laughs> old. It's fine to blame Greeny for anything. Like, it, it's fine. Like for, for the love of God, man, shut up. I half expect, I half expect, you know how there's all the talk about who's going to replace Woj and it's like Jeff oh, Passen or oh Adam God. Jeffrey. Yeah. I am like, Hey, yep. can I get odds on Greeny? Greeny bomb. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Sounds except, like a drug. Except, a greeny bomb. Except his tweet would always be like, would always be like, a superstar could be on the move. We'll tell you who it is next. Yeah, that's it. And then you'd have to wait a while for his next tweet to come out. <laughs> By the time it comes out, Shams has already <laughs> already got it three yeah. times. Yeah. Click, click, Shams click. Shams has the full contract details. <laughs> By the By the time Greeny gets through his tease, three minute break. Yeah. Jesus. Um, what do you What do you guys got coming up on D Lo and KC? Uh, we'll talk about the Devontae Adams stuff quite a bit. We'll talk about some things that James wrote about in the Kings beat last night. We played the sound of Mike Brown, you know, talking about Keon Ellis and Kevin Herter and uh, some different questions that ESPN asked about the Sacramento Kings and other teams in the NBA. So, uh, yeah, lots of lots of good stuff with 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 camp jumping off right now. And James will be back with us at three o'clock for the first time in like a week and a half. I know. It's yeah. Been a while. About time. Finally, got some, does some work. Slacker. Here. God. Yeah. Although I assume you're going. I'm going to camp downtown. right now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to camp. And <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm it's like, like maybe he won't be with us now that I think about it. <laughs> Camp's at one at one o'clock today. Okay. Does, okay. Does your ask. I got you. Uh, I was going to do another Devonte Adams thing, but we got to go. Okay. So, oh, okay. Uh, I, maybe if you guys talk about it and I'm in here, well, I might me. jump in. There you go. All right. I might jump in. Okay. Very good. Uh, that's Damien Barling, Thank you. It is. Thank coming you. in. Yep, I have that, been for a long him. time. Yeah, uh, last time I checked, uh, they're coming up next. That's uh, Disneyland Barling okay. to you, pal. <laughs> this, uh, D, -Land, D Land and Casey coming up next. Um, nope, nope, good, nope. nope. Just I'll see, we'll see you tomorrow. Drink that's good. water, be nice. Thank you. People. There Goodbye, it is, everybody. Oh my god, that's tremendous. Goodbye.